Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the 10th session of the Life of Columbia Transplant Patient Education Session. This session is uh, entitled Innovation in Transplantation, New Medications on the Horizon, and we will broaden it to discussing everything you wanted to know about immunosuppression or lack of it. And for that purpose, we have a, a very distinguished panel to talk about it, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Lloyd Ratner, who is the chief of kidney, trans kidney and pancreas transplantation at Columbia University. Dr. David Cohen, who is the medical director of the Columbia Transplantation Service. Uh, uh, Mr. Kevin Kovalevsky, who is a consultant on, pharm on pharmacology and companies that make drugs, and Dr. Uh, Hussein, who is uh, one of our distinguished uh, nephrologists, transplant nephrologists. Uh, they're all quite expert, and uh, the panel is, uh, as you know, is uh, Karen Hennenberger, who is a physician and a recipient of both kidney and pancreas. She'll comment briefly about her experience and her uh, view of this session. And I am a former founder and director of the transplant service at Columbia and a professor of surgery at Columbia. So Karen, let me turn it over to you. I want, before I finish, I just want to thank Veloxis for sponsoring this uh, sessions and the whole course. Karen, I, let me turn it over to you now. Well, thank you everyone. And thank you so much to our speakers and to my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Hardy, always a pleasure. And, you know, today we have a, a really important topic. Um, everyone uh, who has had a transplant is of course, um, eager to understand what the drugs that are coming in the future are going to be like. You know, we're all incredibly grateful to have this second chance to life. Um, but we all know that it's so important to stay on course and to take the drugs that we are being prescribed. And in many cases, that could be six to 10 drugs a day. Um, immune suppression is not just one shot and uh, or one pill. And uh, many of the immune suppression uh, agents that uh, we are on cause other side effects that lead to other drugs that need to be taken. So uh, today we're gonna focus on transplant medication, but we're also gonna focus on how to get involved in the future of transplant medication, meaning involved in clinical trials, what is the process and, and how do you feel safe being part of that? We have a, a number of great questions that have been submitted to us, but feel free to uh, put your questions into the chat um, and as we are, 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 are going forward. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to open open up to, uh, to a wonderful discussion. Again, um, I'm Karin Hienberger, I'm the CEO of Lifebulb, but I'm here also representing the patients. And so I, I think if we could start out by uh, talking about what, what are the most important uh, new classes for um, uh, the future of, um, or the near future of um, immune suppression of transplant medications. Um, uh, you know, if we, if we start out by asking uh, Dr. Cohen. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I would, I would, um, sort of address the question by looking at what are some of the unmet needs in, in transplantation and how, how are we trying to meet those needs with the medications, with newer medications, or, or some that are not yet uh, approved and some that are already um, on the market. And I guess there are certainly two major categories. And one, one is um, the issue of antibodies, um, that many people from uh, one reason or another make antibodies against other people and these antibodies uh, can cause damage to a, a transplanted organ um, and ultimately lead to rejection of the organ. Um, so that's one major area in, in transplant where we need to make progress. Um, in the past, a huge amount of progress has been made in terms of the other arm of the rejection process, which is the white blood cells that can go into the kidney and 
We focused on that for several decades with a great deal of success. And most of our drugs are really aimed at that arm of the immune response. And we have recently, over the past maybe five to 10 years, realized that antibodies play a very important role. So that's one area where the drug development is important. Um, and the other, which I think uh, uh, Karen mentioned is, is that the medicines we have, um, they're quite effective, but they're far from perfect. Um, and they're imperfect in two ways. One is they can cause problems themselves. And the other is long-term, many people end up with rejection regardless of all the medicines that you take. So we need drugs that will offset at least one of those or both of those uh, potential long-term problems. So those are the code of the two, and, and there may be other uh, areas. Um, certainly acute rejection is, is also an issue that um, needs, needs some uh, advancement and some uh, and better medications. Um, and I guess the last thing I would mention, which I guess is the subject of another uh, uh, webinar is the issue of, of trying to get off all the medicines, um, what we call tolerance in which um, immunosuppressants are given for a period of uh, somewhere between six and 12 months and then to gradually taper it off to zero and then um, uh, the, the transplants are not rejected and patients can go along and, uh, and not have to take any medications and still have successful transplants. So that's a whole other area that um, is one of very active investigation. So, uh, be so before we go on to more detailed discussions, uh, perhaps I can ask uh, Dr. Ratner about another area that is of immediate concern, and that is uh, when a kidney is transplanted, it doesn't work right away in so-called delayed graft function. And there are several medications that are tried for that purpose as well. And Dr. Ratner happens to be an expert in that field. Could you comment about this, Lloyd? Yeah, thank you, Mark. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Lifebulb and, and Karen and, and Dr. Hardy and, and Kevin and Philoxus for uh, supporting this, of this webinar. Um, so getting to Dr. Hardy's point, you know, particularly with deceased donors, when we get a kidney from a deceased donor, uh, anywhere from, you know, 20 to 50% of the time, the kidney won't work appropriately initially. And that's called delayed graft function. And patients often will need dialysis even after the transplant. So, you know, they wind up spending longer time in the hospital, greater risk of having rejection. Uh, the whole post-operative period is much more complicated. So as Dr. Cohen was talking about, what are the unmet needs? So this has re really been an unmet need of trying to get the kidneys to work, you know, right out of the box, so to speak. And uh, a number of companies have developed medications which they were hoping would, you know, have an impact on the, not only uh, whether or not this delayed graft function occurs, but if it does occur, you know, reducing the amount of time that, that people will need to be on dialysis for. And we've been involved in at least three clinical trials of new drugs. And uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with how drugs get approved, um, phase one clinical trials are basically, you know, to assess the safety of the drug. Phase two is to assess not only the safety, but also whether it's effective or not. And then, and also to kind of figure out what the right dosing for the medication is. And then phase three are what they call the, the pivotal trials, which are the big trials, which the uh, Food and Drug Administration, the government decide, looks at the data and says, okay, we're going to approve this drug or not. So we've been involved in a couple of these, like I said, I think three or four different trials with different drugs with very, very different mechanisms of action to try and reduce delayed graft function after deceased donor transplants. And uh, so even though we participated in about three or four different trials so far, none of these drugs have made it to the market. Um, and Can I, I think, ask a yeah. question? Sorry to interrupt, but is that... Um a regular problem within the transplant space that drugs that have been tested in clinical trials have just not reached the market 
you know, if you think about oncology, it seems like we have new drugs all the time and they're being expedited in clinical trials. They're being, and through COVID, we saw how fast it could go through clinical trials. Is there, is there something with transplant where we are seeing a lack of urgency at the agency level? Well, uh, that's a great question, Karen. And, and in fact, one of the things that we've done, both, both Dr. Hardy and I are former presidents of the American Society of Transplant Surgeons. And the American Society of the Transplant Surgeons and the American Society of Transplant for Transplantation, which used to be the American Society of Transplant Physicians, Dr. Cohn played a really important role in for many years. Um, joint thought this was a really big problem that not enough medications were making it through the pipeline. And there are a lot of different reasons for that. But one of the things that we did was we set up an organization called the Transplant Therapeutics Consortium to work with the FDA, to work with drug manufacturers, uh, and to work with you know, the, the scientists and the, the people within the community, the transplant surgeons, transplant nephrologists, transplant cardiologists, et cetera, to try and get more drugs coming through the pipeline. And, you know, I could talk for hours about this and, you know, give whole dissertations, but it's very, it depends a lot on, you know, what kind of endpoints you decide the trial yeah. is going to look at and, you know, how good the results are without the drug. So right now, results of transplantation, although they're not perfect, they're really, really good. And it's tough to show a significant difference in a lot of fields. I think the problem with the drugs for delayed graft function is I think the action is all in the in the deceased donor. I think mm -hmm. that's where the kidneys are, you know, taking a hit, so to speak, and the the die is cast there. And the the interventions haven't been early enough in the chain of events. And I think that's the been been the main problem to date. But you're absolutely right. This is a big problem, but at least yeah, Can I ask you if you in your in your transplant therapeutics consortium had also patient representation, or was this mostly a professional organization? It's mostly a professional organization, um, but I think there is some patient yeah. representation. Because if you look at other disease areas, the patient patients have done a very good job in in going to the White House and going to the FDA and and right. and, and moving advocacy forward and in, in these kind of things. You know, Kevin, come up with things like, um, you know, composite endpoints and not just looking right. at, you know, things, yeah. you know, so. Surrogate markers. Yep. Correct, correct. Yeah. So you we're don't happy, need a five-year study or something. Happy to have the patients be advocating for yeah. improved therapeutics, absolutely. I mean, that has been actually a topic. Many of our, our listeners are on transplant life and it's been, a, it's been a talk. I actually raised that topic. I said, if we could assemble a group of patients who would be you know, willing to speak about this in a, in a formal way, but we don't have an organization to do so. But yeah, I didn't know about this organization. I think that's a great thing. I would love to be part of that. Anyway, that's aside. Kevin, from an industry perspective, what are you seeing? And what have you been seeing over the years in, in transplant that are you know, exciting new programs? Yeah, so, so first off, um, thank you, Karin and, and Dr. Hardy for inviting me to, to participate in this esteemed panel. Um, clearly, I'm the least accomplished of, of, of all the panelists, um, but uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate that you wanted to get um, an industry perspective, which I can provide. I will just say um, any proposal or, or potential conflicts of interest, I was a former employee at CSL Bearing. I still own stock in CSL Bearing. Um, but I don't have any other um, uh, conflicts to disclose. Um, from an industry perspective, as we look at innovation, I would categorize it really in, in, in three buckets. First off, sort of, sort of um, uh, incremental improvements to the current paradigm, which, which you know, trying to find better, less toxic immunosuppression, um, improved patient quality of life with, you know, easier dosing of, of uh, or less frequent dosing of products. Um, and, and then trying to find rejection treatments, right? A lot of now what we have are, are prophylactic immunosuppression, but trying to find treatments for patients who actually experience rejection. Um, the next bucket I would, I, would, um, uh, I would put is more an immunological revolution. So that being um, better diagnostics, 
um, you know, with things like um, cell-free DNA and some of the other things that are being um, that, that, that are, 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 are sort of newer to the market, uh, better organ matching um, and, and, and the opportunities for what genetics and genetic testing and maybe even machine perfusion could, could potentially someday play and, and allowing organs to be, um, uh, you know, uh, outside um, hold ischemic time to be longer um, and what that can mean for testing and ability to, to match patients. Um, and, and then obviously there's immune tolerance therapies, which, you know, again, I think are, are um, really, really exciting, maybe a little further down the road, but, but very exciting. And then the third bucket, um, certainly a lot of news about this is you know, the expanded use of human organs and, and non-human organs. Um, so the opportunities of things like xenotransplant, um, you know, there's been a lot of, lot of talk earlier in the year about, about some of the, um, the advancements that have been made in xeno. Um, things like machine perfusion, again, the, the, the opportunities of, of taking organs that might otherwise be discarded and using those organs, I think, offers the, the, um, uh, the gift of life of transplant to a greater number of patients. And then things like um, manufactured organs. So, so uh, things like, uh, you know, descaffold um, uh, organs that, you know, are using stem cells or 3D printed organs. Again, those are further down the road, but those are, those are the way I think from, from an industry perspective, we tried to bucket, um, the, you know, the, the, um, the, the idea of innovation to try and, and, and because innovation can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, so we tried to break it down a little bit in that, in that regard. So when we planned these sessions, we in fact <clears throat> thought of these buckets and this, this, this session is trying to focus mostly on the drugs, but obviously the next session will be on uh, improving organs on perfusion or, or healing organs or making them better than they are. <clears throat> it's something we will want to discuss broadly, but we can include it here, obviously, because the use of drugs actually is, can be effective on the pump as well particularly, for example, in pneumonias and lungs. So in lung transplantation, now it's possible to cure the pneumonia and the machine and use the, the lungs afterwards. But before we proceed, I, I thought there is one other category that we did not touch, and maybe Ali can comment on it. And that is the matter of actually substituting drugs during the course of the transplant for various reasons, for side effects, perhaps for some side effects, such as uh, some nephrotoxicity from some of the drugs like tacrolimus, or uh, terrible diarrhea from myfortic or cell sept, whatever is used. And a, so and a patient is asking about replacing steroids. Um, and replacing steroids, you can comment on that too, particularly uh, since our experience is very strong in not using them. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, I'll also echo everyone to say thank you for the opportunity to join the panel. Um, but I, I think maybe if we can rephrase that question a little bit, maybe the thing we're trying to figure out is how can we right size everyone's immunosuppression regimen <coughs> to give them exactly what they need and no more and no less, right? That's part of the question and develop a regimen for them that provides the best uh, combination of efficacy and avoiding side effects. And that's really the last part of this research that everyone's talking about. And, you know, I wish that we were in person. I would love to ask uh, by show of hands, like how many people in the audience are on a combination of tacrolimus and mycophenolate? Probably like 90% of people would, would raise their hands. Um, and that should strike everyone as kind of odd, right? Everyone in this audience is a different size, different sex, different amount of uh, body composition, and you're probably all on almost the same regimen. And part of advancing this field is figuring out how can we give everyone exactly what they need? Um, and you know, people like Dr. Retner and Dr. Cohen and Dr. Hardy have been, been on the forefront of figuring out what people can get away with different kinds of regimens. And kind of as Dr. Hardy said, some of that will be dependent on things like side effects, but also uh, some of it will be dependent on um, kind of our advancing knowledge of everyone's individual risk of uh, rejection. Uh, as it pertains to just their own immune system, but also their compatibility with their um, uh, with their donor. So and monitoring, like, and, and monitoring. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and their, and their long term allograft function monitoring. And also, monitoring. I think also the level of function, uh, I think, is important. You know, what 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 is the patient do what what is the level of productivity that they are wanting to achieve uh in their life and and, uh, and maybe where they are the stage of life because if you are willing to take more risk or not willing to take risk i mean and 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 what you want to deliver every day those things are i think very different uh, from patient to patient yeah, and yeah, i think definitely because there will be a trade off in terms of every immunosuppression regimen in terms of side effects um, so, you know, um, if we go to our uh, audience member's question about, you know, are there drugs to replace prednisone? I think Dr. Hardy brought up a good point that at our center, for example, for kidneys, the vast majority of patients are on an early steroid withdrawal regimen, which after the fourth day after transplant, they no longer receive prednisone. And that's very different than some other centers. And I think one therapeutic need uh, in, our, in our field is that we don't have a good enough way to tell you know, who will do okay with that and without that? Who will do okay with a different combination of drugs, both in the short term and long term? And I think that research need is evolving. And I think a similar thing is, is who can receive other non-transplant drugs that might optimize their outcomes. If you look at a lot of drugs, I say that the place where this might come out the best, if we think about it, just because it's in recent history, we think of when we're doing all the studies about COVID, for example, and, and COVID vaccination, which I know is a little bit of a tangent, but bear with me for a second. When we looked at COVID vaccine trials, they excluded everyone who was a transplant. But who was the greatest risk of having a complication mm -hmm. of having COVID was people like our transplant recipients, right? I think a similar thing exists with other drugs that are intended to promote long-term kidney and cardiovascular health. So for example, uh, kind of the hottest drugs now are we call the SGLT2 inhibitors. And you see them commercials for them all the time, I think, like, like Farsagen and Jardians. And all the early trials uh, kind of excluded patients who, uh, who had, for example, kidney transplants. Um, or heart transplants, uh, you know, but there's concerns about whether immunosuppressed patients should be in those trials. But who are the type of patients who might want to maximize their kidney function the most over the long term and have good, reliable ways to intervene to slow their kidney function's decline? Now, these are the groups of patients we need to have, uh, have interventions for. And I think that remains an ongoing uh, therapeutic black hole of whether we can use all these other new technologies that are developed for non-transplant patients and, and kind of also let, implement them in a transplant population. So I think right-sizing immunosuppression and also bringing in other drugs from other spaces and allowing them to be used in transplant patients are, are other ways we can kind of make headway with the drugs that we already have, as well as with new drugs that will come down the pipeline. So we're coming back to the point, I think, with Dr. Ratner made, that there's a certain need for experimentation by the physicians that is already uh, done in oncology and used to be done in HIV. And, and uh, I think, for Kevin, from your perspective, I mean, industry used to go to different countries, right? You know, maybe the U.S. Was, is a little bit more restrictive. Europe is maybe, uh, you know, in some some countries less restrictive. Uh, but then going to South America, and that's not maybe 100% ethical, but you do get something approved that way. Yeah, well, I, I think I, I think conducting global trials is is critical um, because it just opens up uh, the opportunity to so many more patients. Um, certainly, Europe, you know, is 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 most often considered um, outside of the United States. But I think countries like Brazil, um, mm -hmm. certainly, you know, um, you know, China has a lot of people and has a growing transplant market. There are um, some considerations, I think, that, you know, that before you go into the, into the Chinese market, the companies have to consider, um, you know, but, but certainly Japan is, is, is another country that uh, maybe not as much for, for solid organ transplant due to some um, you know, due to, due to low numbers, due to sort of the cultural, um, you know, concerns that, 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 that um, maybe limit the Japanese market compared to other, other countries. But certainly the United States, um, Europe, and, and, and Brazil, Canada, you know, those are all, those are all big markets. And you know, we're still dealing with a relatively small number of, of patients when you talk about the number of transplants that are done per year compared to you know oncology where unfortunately as 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 most of us have been you know um, affected by by you know someone in our family or ourselves having cancer it's so prevalent um, that there just are a lot more more patients available potentially and and frankly there's a lot more noise around uh, around oncology and you know you hear about Project Moonshot from the government, and and you hear about you know um, 
uh, you know, the, 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 public, uh, uh, the, the public campaigns to try and, 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 and um, raise money for cancer research, you know, all those things do make a difference. Um, they, they really do when it comes to, to trying to get a lot of early research that's done, which, you know, it's, we won't talk about that today, but, you know, as the panel knows, early research is the stuff that leads to innovative therapies 15, 20 years down the road. And that's important to do that, that work. Yeah, if I could also comment, you know, about you know, transplant patients have a lot of, a lot of transplant patients have a lot of other illnesses, a lot of medical problems. And, you know, the market is relatively small compared to, let's say, rheumatoid arthritis or some of these autoimmune diseases, which the same medicines may be targets for. And a lot of drug companies, and Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of drug companies, you know, they're concerned about transplant patients screwing up their data, which might hurt them with a bigger market. Um, and I, we've seen that with some drugs, which ultimately got approved that they were doing transplant trials for, and then they, they, they stopped. Uh, the transplant trials when they got approved for other indications. Um, so then the drug never really makes it into the transplant space. The one drug that really comes to mind is, is leflunamide or Arava, which is, a, I think, a very good anti-rejection agent that has a lot of interesting properties, including some antiviral properties that never really made it big time into the transplant space because the trials were terminated once it got approval for another indication. Yeah, I, I, I think that that characterization is, is, is correct in a lot of cases, especially for, for products that are not approved or, or, um, or a transplant indication is not their first target. I, I think that that's why there's so many drugs in transplant that are used off label that are, that are, are effective, but trying to get them through the regulatory hurdles, which are substantial, because the, the, you know, the, the, the FDA and EMA want to see long-term outcomes. Um, and, and as you, you know, I think, you know, Dr. Ratton, you mentioned before, short-term outcomes are, 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 are pretty good now. You know, long-term outcomes, these studies are expensive. It's hard to find patients. Um, they're on so many other drugs. Um, you know, that, that, that there's a lot of potential for drug-drug interactions. You want to be able to isolate. If you're doing a clinical trial, phase three clinical trial, trying to get approval, you want to be able to isolate the effect of that drug. And, and that's it's really challenging in an area where there's, there's so much going on. But I will say, I do think that there are companies that have, have started to show an interest. I think, you know, um, Hansa is one of the Hansa Biomedical, which is a, a, a European company. Um, CSL, you know, um, is, is doing a lot of work in, in transplant. I know um, Alexion um, tried, you know, they tried with, um, you know, with, with their drugs to, to, to come to transplant. And, and you know, as, as sponsored today's program, Veloxis. Veloxis is very, very active in, in this space. You know, they have a really good, again, it's more of an incremental gain in terms of the, their long-acting tacrolimus product, Invarsis XR. But, but they also have some early products um, that I think you know, will, will, will show promise. Now, again, they, they'll have to get through the studies, but, but they're making investments. They're, well, they're going for the anti-CD28, I think. Now, yeah, that is correct, yeah. Which is, which is a very promising agent in terms of inhibiting antigen recognition at the early phases, uh, which is combined with belatacept experimentally has been extraordinarily effective in actually uh, getting very prolonged and long-term graft survival without really significant side effects when done in non-human primates. Belatacept itself has been very effective, but as you said before, it really dropped out of the contention because of the company did not want to continue really uh, investing in it. For trans purposes. I think one thing you need to remember too is that most drugs that enter the pipeline will never make it will never make it all the way to approval. And even drugs that get to phase three trials, almost half of them have failed phase three trials. So it's like we gotta make sure we get enthusiastic about supporting people who are entering this space because you know there is some risk to entering a space, especially if it's a smaller market, because uh, there's the potential for a lot of investment 
uh, for something that won't pay off, which is what yeah. I think what Dr. Ratner was talking about in terms of like yeah. providing support and resources and patient resources too to encourage that development is important. And there, but don't, I mean, add one other number of patients. That's one of the problems. Let me but add one other have wrinkle. To, sorry, to, can I? They're just sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Ratner. Uh, just one other wrinkle is that you know, particularly for these specialty drugs, which are for small markets, you know, they're they're for the drug companies to be able to recoup their their costs for developing them and doing the trials. They're hugely expensive. So, you know, insurance companies are loath to pay for off-label uses of a lot yeah. of these drugs. And that that's another problem. That, that to me, that is a huge problem. And we're seeing that in, in our constituents, right? In, in, our, in, our, in our community, how patients are struggling with getting refills, getting even, even their drugs um, and that uh, taking on economic burden. You know, but I think we need to start, I think, reevaluating this and, and stop, stop saying that it's such a small market. There are 40,000 transplants done every year. You know, uh, walking around in America, how many would you expect? Uh, how, 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 what do you estimate? How many patients uh, are walking around with transplants in America right now? Because the numbers are, are, are different from different sources. Well, uh, probably around three quarters of a million to six, 600,000 to three quarters of a million. So that's not a small market. That's not a small market. If you think about Alexion, as you, you said, Kevin, you know, they made their, their mark in much smaller markets than that. And, and, uh, you know, Regeneron, other companies, uh, you know, have, have, have been able to, our problem is that we're not getting over the regulatory hurdle. And, and, uh, if the science is there. Uh, and we get the patients to sign up to the clinical trials and we can get these surrogate markers approved, you know, we, we have a huge market opportunity for, for, the, for the companies that take that risk, in, in my view. Um, I, 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 I agree. Um, and, and I will, there was a question that was asked in the chat and, and the question was, um, how do we raise the noise level for transplant? And um, I, I will, at the at the risk of, of Karin getting mad at me, um, I, I will throw the, I, I think there's a huge opportunity out there. And I think Lifebulb is the kind of organization that, that can be a galvanizing organization to bring people together. Because it, again, a lot of times people get a transplant and they think it's in essence a cure for whatever caused them to have the transplant, whether it be diabetes or chronic heart failure or, you know, um, you know, uh, alpha one antitrypsin deficiency caused them to get a lung transplant, whatever that was, they, they look at the transplant as, as, as a procedure to in essence, get them over that problem. But I think if we were to bring people together under a common cause and, 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 and to raise the level of excitement, advocacy, um, awareness, that it can go a long way towards getting, getting more uh, share of voice in the community. Yeah, if I could add to that, Kevin, that, you know, I think most people who get transplants, if they're involved in, a, in an organization, it's usually more of a disease specific organization. So we don't have sort of a patient organization right. that puts together all transplant patients, heart transplant, lung transplant, kidney transplant, plus the people on the waiting list. Um, you know, and the, rea yeah. the reality is that as a trans, I mean, I felt this very clearly. I was type one diabetic, but as I, when I got my kidney and my pancreas, I, 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 I have no more home. You know, I'm no longer at home at the JDRF or at the ADA or at the NKF, well, at the NKF perhaps, but 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 it's 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 difficult for trans and and I think so that's one problem. There's no home for transplant patients really. But secondly, most transplant patients are on similar drugs as we have already identified. Most transplant patients have similar complexity with psychology and you know this this opportunity and then the multi-pharma you know regimens that we're on. So there's a there are many reasons for coming together between a heart, a kidney, a lung, intestinal. You know, we all share something very strong. So yeah, there's an opportunity there. Well, we as an education group, an education session, once it's widened throughout the country, we could possibly mobilize the groups as long as we can mobilize also the various organ transplants, not just kidney and pancreas. And this is part of the intention, I think, that Karen has in carrying out the... Uh, 
the uh, mission of Lifeboat. I think that um, uh, certainly National Kidney Foundation is a patient-centered organization. Yeah. Uh, both both the professional transplant societies, you know that. Um, they reply involve kid, kidney kidney and liver uh, in, in particular. I guess the American Society of Transplant Surgeons, the American Society of Transplantation, have patient have in the recent years reached out to patients to make sure they're included in various aspects of the activities of the society and their voice is heard. Um, so I think that for new drug development, for uh, ability to participate in trials, um, I think there are opportunities through the societies uh, to find ways to do this uh, and to get the, get the, make sure that the, the needs that the patients perceive that maybe the physicians and the scientists don't perceive so readily uh, are articulated loud and clear. Yeah, I, I think there are, there, are, there are separate problems. I mean, the other problem that we, we, we want to talk a little bit more on in the, in, the, in the next 10 minutes or so, you know, is really how we can get expedited trials and how we can get patients into the trials. And, you know, we talked about surrogate markers. You know, there are there other, uh, you know, approaches that may get us, uh, or, or is the science just not there yet? You know, do you feel that the science right now is at a level where we can have a monumental change in the in the drug therapeutics that we're placing patients on? Do you feel confident that in the next five years there's going to be a shift? Well, perhaps we should ask that of uh, the clinicians. So yeah. let, let me start with Lloyd. I was, I was going to suggest start with Ali first. Okay, we'll start with Ali first. I think it's hard to believe that we're on the verge of a monumental shift. And I hope to make, I hope Dr. Retner and Dr. Oh, Cohen know a lot more than me. You must be a greater optimist than that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe well, they expected me to be the greater optimist. But I think that, um, I think we're still in the phase of science where we're developing, I think I think the development of, of important surrogate and validated surrogate endpoints is going to be an important part of that. You know, for kidney transplantation, for example, um, you know, a lot of the focus uh, in trials is about rates of rejection or, or rates of, uh, of allograft and patient uh, survival. Um, but I think things like rate of kidney function loss and kidney function uh, as an endpoint are important surrogate endpoints that will help identify promising targets. I think right now there's just not, not nothing, there's not anything in the pipeline right now that's especially exciting uh, with the exception of tolerance, I would say, and xenotransplantation as ways of of uh, kind of advancing the field in a big way. But I think in terms of immunosuppression alone, there's nothing that I've seen that, that really has me super excited about a big shift. Well, I'll say I'm I'm super excited about- David? Well, go look ahead, Lloyd, you're already- I, I was gonna say, I'm super excited about this drug Emlifidase, which we're now in a phase three trial. We're one of 15 centers in the country that have been asked to participate in phase three trials from, from this uh, this drug. And basically what it does is it breaks down antibodies so that people have a lot of antibodies and are difficult to find a match for and can't get transplanted because of that. Um, it offers a lot of promise to be able to get them transplanted. Now, it's early in the trial. The drug has already been approved in Europe, um, but it's, it's relatively new there on the market. So... But uh, I'm very optimistic about this particular drug. Well, that, that, that's a major, major advance, particularly if you can use it right before, uh, before they're transplanted, obviously, and uh, abolish their antibodies, then uh, you really may end up with, uh, with transplanting. What greater percentage, about 20, 30% patients more will be available eventually? Well, potentially, and, and you know, it may also be effective for treating antibody-mediated rejection, but that's not what the phase three trial is about. Uh, and I also, I've been asking the company if we could do a investigator-initiated trial to use it for blood group incompatible transplantation, uh, but they want to get their approval first before any of the water gets muddied with another trial. So they've been they've been keep putting that, is, it, that addresses a question that was from the audience of can you prepare the donor so the donor 
uh, so it's less likely that the recipient rejects the donor kidney. But this is a way of actually reducing the re risk of rejection by treating the recipient. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So I think that um, in terms of major breakthroughs, I think that um, there's a lot of work in the area of tolerance. And um, one of those trials might make a huge difference. We don't know yet. Um, when more and more patients are in, involved and the, the, you know, the time, the duration of the trial goes out several years. Um, but that's certainly, uh, I would say the quickest and most po potential opportunity for a major breakthrough. Um, the other thing I would say about many of these trials that are deemed to be quote unquote unsuccessful um, is that you have a trial in which so if you did a trial in which nobody benefited whatsoever, of course, that would clearly be uh, suggest that the medication uh, being tested was not very good. But in many of these trials, you know, many of the patients benefit, but the percentage of patients who benefit is not great enough that when the statistical analysis is done, that it seems worth pursuing in large populations. And then that's the end of the development of the drug. And I think that the we miss great opportunity to say, well, who are the people who benefited? And let's take, let's do another trial with that type of individual, and see if maybe there is a you know a, a group of people who will benefit from the drug. And it was initially tried in a broad population, and uh, you know, but hasn't we learned we should have learned from that study that not everyone will benefit. Um, so so-called enrichment trials, where you you learn from the previous trial and you move ahead with a group of people who did benefit and learn more about the drug and learn more about um, what the potential for um, uh, for its use is, um, so that it, there are opportunities in that area for sure. But that uh, brings us to the point of trying to uh, get biomarkers for individuals to try to uh, divide the patients into different groups prior to treatment, right? Yes. Yeah, well, that has been challenging. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's been very, very challenging to... Um, and there are companies that are trying to get biomarkers for or genotype patients yeah, to then yeah. try to match to, uh, to treatment. There was a question here saying, how do we know when the immune suppression is, is at the right level? Um, if we're seeing, are we, are we seeing, should we accept more rejection to try to reduce the immune suppression? How do we know it's right? Well, that we... Next session, we will discuss exactly that. And that is the idea of the biomarkers. Mm -hmm. And there are some biomarkers that appear to be actually uh, very beneficial in terms of making that type of analysis. There are already some uh, that have not gained that much popularity and certainly not commercial uh, expansion, but there are some, and we will uh, have a speaker next session who will address this issue, who actually developed one of these things. And this is one of our colleagues, Dr. Suthantaran. From I think that I think that um, in a broader sense, and I, I kind of use the, this phraseology maybe a little too broadly, but we went through decades of. Um, of, of therapeutic advances, more drugs. We got lots of drugs, they got better and better. And now we're at a, a place where we have quite good drugs that work on average quite well, but obviously there are lots of problems. Um, the challenge that we've had recently and that the field is focused on, you know, is, is really uh, what, what I guess I would say, we're in the age of diagnostics. Mm. And I think this was mentioned by Kevin. We're trying to understand better what are potential targets for new drugs? And then we can, there are many ways of identifying drugs, screening existing drugs that might in, impact those targets. Um, and so a lot of this passes under the radar because nothing happens and people are trying to identify mechanisms of in, inflammation, mechanisms of rejection, uh, which would then lead to hopefully an ability to find the drug that will impact that target. And that is somewhat, you know, whether it's genetics, the genetic makeup of the patients, whether it's a better understanding of some of the molecules that are involved in the rejection process. Um, um, 
and then ideally you know, developing or screening products that affect that. And maybe Kevin can comment more, but I think we're in a, in, a, in a phase where to a certain extent, we don't see the results as quickly, but we're trying to come up with the, you know, a, better, a, better way, a better way to develop the drugs to meet the needs uh, at a molecular level. And then that would also potentially enable us to individualize our therapies more. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's, that's a very important point. I, I, I think that the opportunity to think differently about this problem in transplant is, is upon us. And listen, there's no easy answer. Sometimes people say, you know, artificial intelligence, and you think all the world's problems are going to be solved. I, I, I know I'm not, I'm not suggesting that's the case. I think that what, as Dr. Ratner alluded to earlier, what the Transplant Consortium and the Critical Path Project has, has been able to do is to, to, to help get regulators to think differently about right. some use of AI, including the iBox and, and its right. potential use to try and get products approved more quickly. I think there's going to have to be more of that. Um, although I agree with Dr. Hussein in terms of, I don't think that the pipeline for immunosuppression drugs is, is, is terribly robust. I do think that we're close, we're close to some big changes in transplant. And I think that those, you know, if you, if you look at the investments that are being made by, by companies like Hansa with, with Imlifidase, um, CSL, if, if you look at some of the earlier companies, um, ITB Med with their anti-CD2, um, Splitzmab, um, you, you know, Sanofi has a novel complement inhibitor. There are a lot of companies, Veloxa says that the, you know, the anti-CD28 uh, uh, monoclonal antibody, there's a lot of companies investing in this. Now, again, maybe as Dr. Cohn alluded to, we have to stop worrying about the, the, the pathways and, and, and work backwards at the problem. That may be a different approach that, that warrants consideration. But I, I, I'm encouraged. I think that, you know, it's not exactly right around the corner, but I think that there's, there's going to be a lot of innovation over the next five to 10 years in transplant. Can, can I just ask uh, David and maybe you, Kevin, and all, all of you are really, is the issue of, of the marketing and, and, and the intent of the companies to invest in uh, immunosuppressive agent. They all have a great interest in arthritis and autoimmune diseases of various sorts that are really quite big markets. We can borrow certainly a lot from those, uh, those drives. And I wonder whether we do enough exploration of some of the drugs that are being developed for the big autoimmune disease markets that actually do, uh, in, do act on to inhibit rejections or promote rejections, which we don't want to do, obviously. But uh, it is the two sides of a coin. And if we look at the coin very carefully in various ways and encourage the company in a specific direction, perhaps we can succeed there to influence uh, the companies in terms of their expansion of their marketing ideas and, and trials. Just before you comment on that, I just want to, you know, I, I, uh, add to that because that is exactly what JDRF tried to do in type 1 diabetes, where there were lots of drugs being developed in other disease areas. They haven't been successful yet because we don't have many more drugs in type 1, but I think we're getting there, is to direct companies by giving grants to do an exploratory trial in a different indication than what they had originally planned for. So doing uh, investigative analysis uh, using a drug that potentially could be beneficial in transplant, but right now is geared toward rheumatoid arth arthritis or Crohn's disease or some, some other area. That, that, that is quite, and that could be done at a university level as well, of course, as an investigator initiated trial. Um, I, I like the idea. And, and also could in fact you utilize some of the benefits of artificial intelligence in the sense that David and Kevin have uh, approached and that uh, exploring the, the targets for the various agents, 
more precisely, usually the targets, once the pharmaceutical company develops a drug, the targets are pretty well defined. The question is, are they useful for us as to our targets? And borrowing the drug, borrowing the drugs that have the correct targets and mix and match perhaps. And the other question that I want you to ask, but we don't have time really anymore, but maybe you can comment briefly is, we are already doing a lot of mix and matching for the drugs that are available. Can we develop, do you think, and I direct that particularly to, uh, to Ali and David, can we do this more rationally so that we can actually get greater effect, effect of the drugs, of the combinations with decrease in toxicity? Uh, obviously, I have my own pet mixtures and you all know about them. I won't publicize them, but the fact is that mix and match can be extremely useful to decrease the toxicity and improve uh, effectiveness. David? No, I think that holds a lot of promise. Um, but can we do it in a rational way rather than a haphazard way? Well, the, the, yeah, that's, that's the crucial thing. And like, it comes back again to identifying the proper patients, or the, the, knowing what, what each patient needs or having some way to get a much better handle on what's liable to work best in which group of patients. And, um, but yes, I think the, you know, as you well know that for many, many years, all the, the new drugs in the immune field were developed in transplant and then borrowed by all the other fields, by rheumatology, by glomerular nephritis. And now it's, the, now, it's the, now it's the other way around. Now we're looking to steal their drugs because they're not developing things in transplant. Um, so yes, I think the idea that we could, uh, um, you know, there are so many different drugs and so many different pathways affected in various kinds of inflammatory and autoimmune disease that there's great opportunity to borrow these drugs. So that means having a registry and setting up clinical trials that are maybe smaller in nature, but doing faster, maybe expedited trials. Well, yeah, it's much, I mean, if the drug is already on the market, it's a lot easier yeah. to do, um, you know, either it's an investigator initiated with the company or, some, or getting some kind of grant to do right. a clinical trial. Um, but yeah, I think that the, the, the yeah, devil's, yeah. devil's in the details. And it's easy. I, I appreciate that Mark says, uh, you know, we do this in a rational way. That, that <laughs> That's the challenge. Um, we yep. don't want to do, do it willy-nilly. Yeah, I think protocols, more protocols in that way, which means that patients have to work with us, but that, that usually is not as much of a problem as uh, is described. Uh, Ali, any comment? Yeah, um, so uh, the multi-part questions, I'll give you a multi-part answer, but I think part, part of the first uh, issue in terms of developing better regimens, including drugs that we already have, is that it's easier to start those trials conceptually because you're using drugs that are approved. Mm -hmm. The downside is that not a lot of people who are enthusiastic to pay for them because if you're a drug company saying, and you say to them, hey, I wanna give someone your same exact drug, but only give half of it. There's not a lot of incentive to that company to say, oh, well, yes, uh, I'd like to prove that you can use half of my drug and uh, be just as effective by using half someone else's also. So I think there are some practical limitations we have, and that is where the patient voice comes in handy of saying, okay, we have a, a better source of funding for those things, which is the federal government's research right. infrastructure and kind of uh, patient level advocacy, to kind of beating down the doors of your legislator saying, this is an unmet need that needs funding. Because if you look at something like kidney disease, for example, the funding for kidney disease research as opposed to the number of patients who have kidney disease compared to that ratio for other, other diseases is, is really terrible. Um, I think part of that will include better big data uh, uh, investigation. So if you look at um, kind of new things on the, on the, on the I guess not on the horizon because they're in, a, in action now, but there's things like this consortium called Odyssey which combines over 600 million patient records from around the world mm. to provide high quality observational research uh, to look at things like, uh, you know, um, some conditions in transplant might be rare, you know, maybe some combinations of donor and recipient characteristics, but by looking at these massive pool data sets of, of uh, electronic medical records, we can answer questions in a quasi-experimental way to say, okay, among the 
10,000 patients around the world in the last 100 years, who, or not 100, but last 30 years, who've had this combination of factors, how have they done that they were on tecrolimus versus not on tecrolimus, for example? And kind of that massive pooling of millions and millions of, of records together can help generate some of those ideas. Yep. I think finally, to answer the last part of the question, which is about repurposing drugs, I think maybe one thing that Kevin and Dr. Cohen can answer, maybe even Dr. Hardy, uh, and I hate this to be the pessimistic one, but I don't think the big advance we're gonna have in transplant is from pulling some drug from a different field, uh, like rheumatoid arthritis or something that already exists. I think uh, by and large, a lot of the immunosuppression that we deal with in all uh, different uh, aspects of medicine have the same kind of suboptimal characteristics, which is that they give some immunosuppression in a, in a non-personalized way and have a lot of side effects. I think what our focus for the long-term future on is why, it's why I said I'm not really optimistic about the next five years, but I'm optimistic about 20 years from now, which is that we need drugs that work differently than the way that the drugs that we have today work. And or, not, can, or not at all. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, well, yeah. on that, on that note. I, on that note. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> On that note, I'd, li I'd like to finish this uh, and give you a promissory note that at the next session, uh, which will be, uh, which is scheduled for, uh, oh. September 21st. September 21. I'm giving myself a month. Is, is going to be, <laughs> toler part of it will be tolerance induction and xenotransplantation. In the meantime, I would like to thank very much for a very exciting and stimulating session. Uh, I'd like to, in order, I'd like to thank Kevin Kowalewski, uh, David Cohen, and uh, Ali Hussein. And I see that uh, Lloyd Ratner had to return to the operating room. Uh, and uh, we are very grateful to you for your participation, your ideas. I think it was a very stimulating session and uh, hopefully some of the ideas will be put into action. I thank very much my uh, co-moderator, uh, Karen, and I thank Veloxis for supporting this and I turn it over for a goodbye by Karen. <laughs> You've said it all. So thank you so much. I really appreciate everyone's uh, enthusiasm. I mean, this this is this was really one of the best sessions. I think the uh, interaction here, and uh, of course, the topic is uh, is truly exciting, and it's multi pronged. Um, uh, we um, we I think we identified several different gaps and unmet needs, and uh, we uh, I think it's promising to hear that the science is probably on, on, on the verge of being there. And um, um, we just need uh, various different efforts now, including patient advocacy, including regulatory strategy, financial strategy. We need to raise more money in this space and we need to make it, make it um, uh, potentially interesting to investors to, to, to put money into uh, the transplant space. So we need to show that. So there's work to be done. I also think this whole idea of registries and doing more observational studies and, and formalizing existing protocols is a good step because as I think um, Ali said, it may not be that the revolution happens tomorrow, but if we can stepwise reach uh, better you know, outcomes in the next few years, it's gonna give hope. And that will trigger more investment and more, 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 more passion and more also strong scientists and medical doctors who go into the space, young people. Um, and, and there's hope there too, I think, especially after spending uh, the, the morning with a young medical student who wants to be uh, a transplant surgeon herself. So thank you so much um, uh, to all of our uh, listeners and to our panel. And of course, the guru, uh, prof Professor Dr. Hardy. Thank, thank you, and I want to assure our audience that we will try to answer your questions more specifically. I see there is a long list of very specific questions. Yeah, we sort of when the we kept attention. We kept, we kept. Yeah, but we will. We have a record of it, and we. Will. We'll try to reply to this. Yeah, and as as always, this, was, this is Goodbye. archived, and you can you can watch it over again. Um, so. Don't worry if you if, if for people who missed it. So you can you can let people know that they can come on to Transplant Life and see this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.